freedom. And she was, she was in a duo at that time, but it was still like not quite scratching that itch. So she um, quit her job. She'd saved up a bunch of money, started learning Ableton, then quit her job. Uh, she had enough money to, to like leave for a year, basically. And she dove 100% into making her record. She didn't know Ableton before like doing this. She taught herself how to produce and she created every single sound that you hear on that, uh, in that mix and all that. So um, I didn't do any additional production or anything. That's all her. She recorded all of her own vocals and everything. Uh, When it got time to mix it, she was going to do the same approach and mix it herself, but she wasn't happy with the car test or whatever. So um, she, she got to the point where, you know, she felt like she had, invested as much energy as she could in that part of it, but she wanted something different. So she reached out to a bunch of mixed engineers and I was lucky enough to um, have a conversation with her and she chose me for it. And uh, it worked out well because she also made um, sculptures for every single song on the record and basically for all of the social media content, the album art and everything. She made... um, sculpture pieces that went along with every single theme and every lyric like kind of idea that went through it so what happened was she moved back to columbus um she spent about six months here um we were working uh maybe two or three days a week on the record and the other time she was spending um in a family member's garage working on the sculptures so this is somebody who like invested a crazy amount of effort and time into into this project or whatever. But I want to say that that wow. song took us about, uh, I think it was a three day mix um, because there was so much stuff going on in it. But uh, testament to like her production, you know, talents like one teaching herself how to do that on the on her first record and having it come out the way it did was like that kind of blew my mind. Like, cause when I heard the roughs, I was like, I have to mix this record. Like, I don't know what I'm going to have to do to get it, but I'm going to mix this record, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. and yeah, luckily she like, liked our, you know, conversation and vibe after we met and all that. So, um, it was, it was just a pleasure to work on it. Like she's a, a great talented artist. And, um, I, I think I like said to you at one point, like that track to me was like doing Atmos in a stereo mix. You know, that was, mm-hmm. that was one of the fun things. So it kind of called back to my days as like a sound designer for video, you know, from a decade before, like, okay, what are some of the things I used to do with sound design that, that made all of these different things fit inside of a jar, you know, really large canvas or whatever. There's a lot going on in that song. Um, but it needs to like the, the main thought was like, it has to grow from section to section, even once it's in the crazy middle section, we still need to lift up. So that at one point there's like a synth pad, like, chord that comes in and that's it does feel like it's another dynamic level up but how is that possible when you've got this insane drum break going on and all of these noises flying around and all that so leaving like headroom for that stuff is really important you know the uh the vocals she wanted very loud very you know present and and forward um and this is a fun a b thing at the time she for references i had the prodigy um and (laughs) I can't remember if I pulled these out. I think that she showed me Ariana Grande. Uh, it might have been Positions, or uh, I think the song is like Break Up with Your Boyfriend. It was one of those. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other one, like she liked what Billie Eilish was doing, but she didn't want to. She didn't want a dark sound on it. She wanted to sound the energy of Prodigy, the brightness and pop feel of Ariana Grande, and some of the vibe of what was going on with Billie Eilish, but not that dark. So mm. one thing that was yeah, interesting. The crunchiness. Right. Yeah. I was making yeah. like a reference playlist when we were working on the record and I put the Billie Eilish tune, like uh bad guy, um, which again, like it just come out, but I put bad guy in there and break up with your boyfriend. And if you play those two mixes next to each other, they are They're opposites, complete opposites. And it's like the best comparison ever. Cause like when, a, when you're talking to a client and you're trying to explain like, bright and dark mix or something like that if you just play them those two side by side they're like got it i get it you know it's amazing like, yeah yeah it's it's well, really <laughs> a great a b or whatever it's instantly we'll have to show to those two back, back to back yeah yeah like the change in the vocal quality and everything right and, there, there are two singers that are yeah they're just completely different opposite singers are also right like billy's like almost whispering it's like just very right there in your face whereas like you know ariana is more of a diva you know yeah yeah, yeah. with like it's supposed it's, to sound like diamond shimmering or whatever and right exactly yeah. Yeah, exactly yeah yeah it's wild but you can 
really somebody who doesn't know um, the difference in like styles of mixing, you can very quickly get the point across when you do those two back to back. That was one of the fun takeaways from that record for me. Do you remember anything technical from that mix that stands out? Yeah, there was a lot of, um, I think like, I think that drum break, I can't remember if it was like a loop with some extra kicks and snares uh, sampled in. I might've done some like sample augmentation on it so I could actually get some more punch out of the drum loop that I was given too. Uh, and then I know like that whole record, um, it was pretty hybrid. I have um, a Rupert Neve 5059 like summing mixer thing uh, that had a dangerous compressor. I think what on the mix bus, I was going back into a UA2192 converter. Um, that was the tone for that whole record. And then I was doing some hardware insert stuff on, on specific tracks or whatever. Uh, but I think like with the sound design portion of it, the big thing that was like pretty awesome was like Michael Brower's motion was a big part of that mm. uh, West End song. That's the Waves plugin? Yeah, yeah. And it this is like mixing philosophy for me. This is probably uh, my biggest thing after, like it is an intention thing, but um, this is probably my biggest thing. So I love depth in mixing as does anybody, but like I'm obsessed with the, in a stereo mix, the ability to take something and have it sound like it's right in front of your nose. And then also have something that sounds, you know, like it's a hundred yards away and so deep and far back. And then everything that happens in between it which is one of the reasons I yeah. love this mix so much, but um, I'm obsessed mm. with that. Like that's one of the first things I love to do when I start building the canvas for any song is like who's living where, not only left, right, but front to back. Front to back. I yeah. love that. Um, do you and think of that as like a reverb thing or as like a volume thing or a bit of both? It's, I think everything, like it's um, it's volume, it's frequency response. Uh right probably right. those two first and then it goes into like what kind of reflections are happening and is it reverb sound is it delay sounds you know like how are we moving right. things and pushing them something that is very close to you like has more low end presence has a little more high end presence and all that but when, as it moves away it thins out and all those things you start hearing the space around it and yeah um that's mm-hmm. that's one of my biggest passions and it's uh tangent a little bit but it's exactly like what i used to place vocals in the mix too and it's that early decision thing of like what do i want this to sound like but uh you can't have an upfront vocal without having something behind it obviously and let's say it's a pop tune um this is i i really learned this from fab too but uh if it's a pop tune you want the vocals the center stage right uh so let's say this is the vocal but how do you know that that's center stage? It's like, well, the snare drum can't be in front of it, right? So if the snare drum's back here, now the vocal's on top. So one of the ways that I'll place um, like a pop vocal is if I've got my kit balance already kind of set up, it's like vocal has to live in front of the snare, vocal has to live in front of the snare. And then once I've got it, like, you know, you're you're moving the fader up and it's kind of doing this. And then like, once you lock it into the right depth, you're like, That's how Mm -hmm. loud the lead vocal is supposed to be, you know, but you'll feel like when it's at the right distance front to back versus other elements in the mix. And like, that's basically how I make my decision about like how loud should the lead vocal be, which is also one of the most asked questions on pure mix or whatever from the community. Yeah. So just, just right in front of the snare drum. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or if it's, you know, if I'm mixing like a Foo Fighters thing, like the snare drum is going to be here, the guitars are going to be like here, like out in front and the vocal is going to be back here somewhere. You know, like right. kind, of, kind of thinking about that. And sorry for doing it with the camera. Podcasters can't see that, but yeah, poc- unless I hi- post this as a highlight, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah. maybe I will. Yeah, That'd be fun. Uh, the Foo Fighters example. I just I had like the guitars as the most front thing, and then the snare is like behind that, and then the lead vocals a little behind that. And if you think right. about the emotion of that too, like a pop vocal is way different than that. It's the opposite. But in a in a rock thing. If the vocal is slightly tucked behind the band, behind the snare, that emotion is like that band is loud as hell, right? And if the singer is screaming his ass off, but you hear him behind the snare drum, that is rage, right? Like that, that's like energy mm. and excitement and all that. So again, like yeah. front to back, like balancing is the important thing. That's the word that we say a lot of times. But if you think about that in terms of front to back, like where is everybody in relation to me? Not in a like, mm. how do I see them on the stage way, but like, where do I hear them or whatever? You can change yeah. the, the emotion of a mix completely with that. That's interesting. I need to think about 
what that what balance means in terms of emotions and that in that kind of sense more and kind of maybe listen to some more records and and think yeah. about that that's really neat yeah uh, wait wait so just going back to what you were talking about with michael brower's motion plug and what exactly were you mm. doing there inside this particular mix yeah a lot of that was i wanted things to be swinging across the back wall you know back wall being um if you're looking at your speakers it's the the furthest point away from you so i call that the back wall whereas the front wall would be like where that in a pop session like where is the lead vocal living so the mm. back wall is um that defines like the canvas right so it's like once i establish who's what the farthest back thing in the mix is now i know what the the play area is between the back and the front of the mix which is the exact same way that a lot of atmos mixers think about the canvas of Atmos or whatever. So mm. thinking about stereo as Atmos, um, I think about the back wall and the motion plugin I was using to toss things across the back wall. And a lot of times, like to me, it feels like it's a U shape, you know, like you're looking into a, into a dome or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So motion does that in a really cool way where as something travels across the back of, it's like a circular ring. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. Um, we're on audio. Uh, so <laughs> when uh, motion has like, it's a couple of spheres inside of it. And then there's some spinning rings and there's a, you know, a little object that spins along the ring. Um, and motion does a great job of as it's moving toward the back, it'll, you know, it feels to me like the, it's doing some high frequency cutting and some low frequency cutting. And it's, it's doing the appropriate things to make it feel like it's in the back of the mix. Um, I don't, I think Michael, said this somewhere but i think it was based off of like cyclotron or something like that there was a, a hardware unit that did something like that and then he wanted mm -hmm. some different things so he, he put them in there but that movement across the back wall is is the thing i love about it so it's kind of like an auto panner in that sense but you can actually be specific with it and automate the parameters to like no i want you to live here at this moment not like be on you know cruise control just doing whatever based on the beat you right know, or whatever so, right yeah nice um, that was the biggest thing though. Like it took three days because the automation was so specific on, on everything. Like I, I really wanted to be yes. specific about where things were happening in the, in the canvas and where's Very the cool. baby coming from? Where's the cell phone sound coming from? Like all that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Instagram. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's, I, yeah, she's one of my favorite artists. That was such a fun record to work on. Like period, one yeah, of my favorite super artists. Cool. She's great. Well, you definitely nailed it, and the, the mix sounds great, and it's like you definitely feel the evolution of the song as it kind of go through it. I know our listeners will only have heard about ninety seconds of it, but yeah. um, you can there'll be a link in the show notes to listen to the whole thing. Nice. Um, and just in general, like people should go ch just check out your mixing. It sounds great. Um, there are some other tracks there on your on your playlist that I, I thought were awesome, and uh, you got to work with uh, Charlie Hunter, which is super cool. So maybe we'll have you back on the show. We could get deeper into like the, the mixing and the producing and the creative end of things, because yeah. uh, there's just this is just getting already really long. Sure, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I try I, I try to uh, not go insane insane lengths. I know Andrew Sheps can go up to six hours, but I'm not there yet. Maybe yeah. one day. But, He's a young but, guy uh, who can do it. I'm like yes, us. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> he's, he's killing. He's killing me with uh, you know his beard and hair. Still you know still rocking my beard. So my beard and hair. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it, it, totally. Well, anyways, but um, uh, but yeah, all that to say, like, yeah, all the mixes sound great. But uh, since it's getting long in the tooth, let's let's. I kind of like to move over to some more general general questions uh, as I get to, towards the end of the interview, um, and uh, the first of which is just about creativity and and uh, energy and and you know we all have days where we're pumped to get in the studio and work right. and we're, there's days where we're a little bit less pumped and it sounds like you're doing a lot of work uh in, even though it's in a lot less time now than maybe it used to be you're still doing a ton how do you keep yourself in that good energy spirit maybe you have some routines or practices anything that kind of keeps you you know in that zone absolutely so um yeah two things one of them uh like it's just the thing that we talked about already about like refining processes down to it like removing the junk that I don't need to be doing. Like um, automating and delegating is a huge thing. Um, I read the four hour work week after I had done all this stuff because I learned about it from Chris's podcast, but uh, <laughs> that book was really good. And um, it's, I know that like my, my pessimistic attitude toward it was like, that sounds like BS or whatever. But when I read it, it, it really did shine a light on like, well, I, I can do things so much better and I would be happier and me making better art. So um, focusing on that kind of stuff is great. Like figure out the things that you can kind of just do less of. Um, another one too, like along that line is, uh, you know, I, 
there's such a thing in our industry about like, man, I worked a hundred hours last week. Like I'm killing it, man. And it's like, it's, it's like this badge of honor that like people like to wear. And like Chris talks about this on his podcast. 